Welcome to Mount Tam Astronomy, a summertime lecture series normally held in Cushing Memorial Amphitheater on Mount Tamalpais, north of San Francisco. I'm Tucker Hyatt, founding director of Wonderfest, the Bay Area beacon of science. Please join me now for another enlightening astronomy program. Near-Earth asteroids, NEAs, are small solar system bodies in orbits that come near or cross the orbit of Earth. There are some 20,000 NEAs, with roughly 10% being potentially hazardous to Earthlings. Now, Dr. Michael Bush, research scientist at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, will explore NEAs as unique physical worlds, as impact hazards to Earth, and as accessible destinations for our spacecraft. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to talk to Friends of Mount Tam. And thanks go to the organizers for letting me do this by video recording, as well as to everybody looking at this on YouTube, if this is in real time or if it's six months afterwards. So my name is Michael Bush. I am a planetary astronomer at the SETI Institute, which is usually in Mountain View, California, but we are all stuck at home right now, as everyone is. I will be talking today about the near-Earth asteroids, spacecraft missions to them, and also the near-Earth asteroid impact hazard. We'll be talking about the work that's been done over the past several decades by Quite a large number of people. I'm going to be giving credit where I can, but there's a lot of people who are working on this and I cannot possibly name everyone individually. So thanks go to many hundreds of astronomers and engineers who have done the work I'll be talking about today. So this is a chart of the inner solar system out to the orbit of Jupiter as of one particular day last year. This is prepared by the Minor Planet, Cent Minor Planet Center, which is operated by the International Astronomical Union and serves as a clearinghouse for all discoveries of everything in the solar system. Since this chart was made, more things have been added. Everything has also moved around. What I'm trying to do here is use it to illustrate how there's different populations of objects in orbit around the sun. The sun is in the middle in this picture. We have the orbits of the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, going outwards. Earth is down just a little to the left and below the Sun. This is June of last year. We're a little bit further back in our orbit right now, but still on the orbit. We have the orbit of Mars. Jupiter is all the way out. It's moved along a little bit in its orbit since the time of this image, but again, still along that curve. All the little dots here are different populations of objects on their own orbits around the Sun. The blue dots on Charon Jupiter's orbit are the Trojan asteroids in front of and behind the planet. We have the main asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, with green dots. There's some comets passing through that are in light blue. The near-Earth asteroids are marked here in red. Now, Near-Earth is defined as nearby on the scale of the solar system. As many of you know, the Earth is 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers from the Sun, give or take a million or so kilometers depending on the time of the year. Something is a near-Earth asteroid if it comes within 50 million kilometers of the Earth's orbit on its own orbit around the Sun. Technically, it's 0.3 AU, but it's about 50 million kilometers at that minimum distance between the Earth's orbit and the asteroid's orbit. That's nearby as compared to the distance from the Earth to the Sun, or from anything in the asteroid belt to the Sun, but it's quite far away as compared to the size of the Earth. There's a lot of objects out there. There's about 1,000 near-Earth asteroids larger than one kilometer in diameter. There's many, many smaller objects. But, of course, they are very thinly spread. It's one 
billion miles, one and a half billion kilometers roughly, from one side of Jupiter's orbit to the other. And you can see that some of the near-Earth asteroids do get out as far as Jupiter's orbit, others get in closer to the Sun. So we've got a lot of objects out there, but they're very, very thinly spread in space. Like having to tell elementary school students when I talk about this that it is not like these Star Wars movies, where they always put the asteroids all on top of each other. They are so thinly spread that they're like grains of dust on opposite sides of the room. And of course, this makes sense if we go out at night and it's a clear night, not too much light pollution, you can see stars, you don't see asteroids blocking your view everywhere. Now, there's a bunch of reasons we study near-Earth asteroids. One key point is that they give us access to things that came from the main asteroid belt in closer proximity to the Earth. So the near-Earth asteroid population is not stable. On timescales of several million years, the asteroids that we see, see will stop being near-Earth asteroids, and new near-Earth asteroids will replace them, triggered mostly by interactions between Jupiter and objects in the asteroid belt. So stuff gets pushed mostly by radiation pressure onto orbital resonance with Jupiter or Mars or Saturn, and eccentricity gets pumped up and it falls into the inner solar system. And then we have a near-Earth asteroid. So the near-Earth objects we're seeing now are remnants of planet formation, as the, as the whole asteroid belt is, since we've never had a lar single large planet out there, because Jupiter scattered the orbits around. And when they run into each other, they erode rather than accreting. So the asteroids we see are interesting relics of early history of the solar system, except they've been through their own complicated history of asteroids running into each other, and then getting thrown into different orbits. So one of the reasons to study the near-Earth asteroids is we can study smaller objects more easily because they pass closer to the Earth than when we're studying things out in the main asteroid belt. We can start to learn more about that whole process of planet formation, the early stages of it, building up asteroid-shaped sized objects, and then what's happened the last four and a half billion years of collisions between things, and the structures of objects that result from that. We have the next slide here. This is shapes of different asteroids as seen by spacecraft. The collage here is by Emily Lakdawalla of the Planetary Society. She does a lot of very, very good visualizations like this. These are all to the same relative size. They are not quite to the same relative brightness. Matilda, in the lower right there, for instance, is actually much darker than it appears here, as do the comets, but they don't show up that well if then on your computer monitor if I were as black as they are. But there's very wide variation here. We've got very light colored rocks reflecting 30% of light that hits them. We've got very dark colored rocks reflecting a few percent of light that hits them. We've got some objects that are made of metal. We've got some objects that are rich in water and carbon compounds. We're seeing that this range of composition is different reservoirs of material from the early solar system. We also see here a wide range of shapes. They are not round. This is because asteroids are small. Ceres, Vesta, these get called dwarf planets sometimes. They're big enough, 900 kilometers per Ceres, just under 500 kilometers for Vesta, that gravity makes them roughly ellipsoidal. But you get down to something like Letitia, 130 kilometers, 80 miles long, it's not round anymore. And you can see, even while Letitia may be four and a half billion years old, the age of the solar system, it has gotten significant fractions of its volume blown out in collisions over the past four and a half billion years. Almost all the smaller asteroids we see here are remnants of previous asteroid-asteroid collisions. To avoid confusion, the objects in the lower right corner, the six down there, are comets that have been visited by spacecraft. I'm not going to talk too much about them in this talk. We do have, for those who are tuning in as this goes live, the chat function available. If you want to ask questions, I can, as we go, I can try to answer them. Questions about asteroids will get answered, hopefully, as I keep talking. Questions about comets may need to wait. Or you can ask them. I'll try to answer them in the chat while I am looking at it. So smaller asteroids that are remnants of asteroid-asteroid collisions. They are reaccumulated collisional debris. 
this gives a particular structure, which is really well illustrated by the small dot there just to the left of Letitia and just underneath Ida in the top right center of the image. This is the asteroid Ilokawa. We're going to zoom way in on that dot. This is Hirokawa, seen by the Hayabusa spacecraft, launched by the Japanese space agency, JAXA, in 2005. Hayabusa came up to a few, within a few kilometers of the asteroid, made a series of images mapping the whole thing, it touched down on the surface, collected a small sample of dust, and returned it to the Earth. The asteroid here is 540 meters long. That is, for comparison, five and a half times roughly the length of the International Space Station. The single largest blocks you see on its surface, such as the one at the top of the object is portrayed here, are about 80, 100 meters across. So the size of the International Space Station, just apparently solid blocks. But there's a whole size distribution here. It's a pile of rubble, all the way down from 100 meter scale blocks down to powder dust less than a millimeter. And despite that, there being no atmosphere and no water here, liquid water, and the gravity is 10,000 times less than what you and I are experiencing in this room, although it's, but sorry, I say this room as if I was in the same room as you. 10,000 times less the gravity you and I are experiencing on the surface of the Earth, or near the surface of the Earth, the Rocks here are not randomly mixed up together. Something separated them out. So there's weird geology going on here. Now the object's not round. It looks almost like there were two piles of rocks and they very slowly came together and settled down. We see this contact binary structure on a fair number of near-Earth asteroids, actually, which is interesting. But it's also interesting that you've got some sorting process going on here that's fairly efficiently separated out the really fine dust from the really big rocks. There's a few possibilities here. We can talk about things like electrostatic charge levitating dust and moving it around. We don't think of electrostatic charge mattering for geology on Earth, but when the gravity is 10,000 times less, you can actually levitate fairly big pieces of dust or gravel even with charging up from the solar wind, depositing protons and electrons into the surface and stuff getting moved around. Christine Hartzell is a professor at the University of Maryland. She's been studying this for Yudokawa and other asteroids. And it's kind of a complicated thing because the gravity field here is not uniform either. The shape is so irregular. We can talk about things like radiation pressure mattering. We don't think of this mattering for geology on the Earth, but light does carry momentum. And if you shine a light on a surface out of space for long enough, and it's asymmetric like this shape is, you can actually spin the asteroid up to break up speed and it will come apart and reconfigure. This is called the yarkovsky okeefe radzvetsky paddock effect, or YORP. You can perhaps see why we use the abbreviation. But this turns out to matter for something like this, half a mile, third of a mile long, 540 meters. It, over 100,000 years or so, can get spun up, break apart, and then recombine potentially, all under the influence of sunlight. So these are just really bizarre physical environments, as well as telling us about the history of the solar system and processes active then and since. We study near-Earth asteroids just because they are really weird places, and all of our normal intuition sort of breaks down from a geological standpoint, and we learn things. There is, of course, Another reason we study near-Earth asteroids, which I gave away in the title slide, this is the near-Earth asteroid impact hazard. And this is probably the one that gets the most public attention for good reason. Asteroids do hit the Earth. I talked about how the near-Earth asteroid population is replaced on a time scale of a few million years. Things stop being on near-Earth orbits and they go somewhere else. Sometimes they fly by Jupiter, out at Apelion, and they get thrown out the inner solar system completely. Sometimes their eccentricity gets run up to the point that they fall in towards the sun, and either they 
undergo some thermal expansion and contraction is fracture, or they fall into the sun and actually are vaporized, which is pretty dramatic when it happens. Or the asteroids get hit by something and disrupt it completely, or they spin up and they break to pieces, or they hit something. Sometimes that something is a planet. Sometimes that planet is the Earth. And so there is the asteroid impact hazard. Now, very small asteroids, only a few meters wide, these do not pose a hazard. They fall out of the sky. They get stopped up in the upper atmosphere. All their kinetic energy gets converted into heat and light and sound, harmlessly very high up. You see a shooting star. It may be it drops meteorites. I am cheating a little bit here. We have found three asteroids out in space so far before they landed. I say we, the Asteroid Discovery Surveys found them. One of my colleagues at the SETI Institute, Peter Yaniskins, has been going around chasing these things and picking up meteorites, but I could not borrow one of his samples to show you today. Instead, this is a piece of Campo de Celio, which is a meteor fall that landed in what is currently Argentina a few thousand years ago. I just happened to have it available as an example. So small, few meter objects, bright shooting stars, drop meteorites. The problem becomes when things are bigger. Larger objects, they can pass through more air without losing all of their momentum. And then they deposit their energy closer to the surface. This is Chelyabinsk in Russia back in 2013. An object 15 to 20 meters across came in, hit the atmosphere above the city. This is somebody out on the edge of town. And it made this trail of debris after very briefly producing a fireball that was as bright as the sun. All the energy went into heat and light and sound only a few kilometers up, 10 kilometers or so. The shock wave reached the ground between 30 seconds and a couple of minutes later, depending upon where the city we are talking about, and blew out quite a lot of windows. About 1,600 people were injured. Nobody died, but it was a very near thing. We would like to know about anything like this with some advanced notice so we could at least have people stay away from windows if they are in the affected zone. Smaller objects are more common than large objects, so larger impacts happen less often. This is Meteor Crater, Behringer Crater, in it's currently northern Arizona. It's 50,000 years old. This was a 50 meter object. It came more or less straight down. Chelyabinsk was coming in at a pretty steep angle and made a very large crater. 800 some meters across and quite deep. You can visit now if you like. If you go up to the visitor parking lot and the visitor center up at the north side there, you are standing on the ejecta blanket. Everything that was inside the crater got blown up and landed back down all around the edges. And if you go around with a metal detector, you can pick up pieces of the meteorite from that. The impactor was rendered into lots of small bits. So something like this happens somewhere in the world probably every several hundred years. Mostly it happens over the ocean. The craters aren't really preserved for something this size. You get a transient crater in the water. Northern Arizona, the erosion rate is pretty low, so this has been pretty well preserved. There's a few hundred other impact craters people identify scattered around the Earth in various stages of erosion. What got people really understanding the asteroid impact hazard as a problem, potentially, back in the 1980s was a much older impact crater. This is the dinosaur killing impact. 66 million years ago, a object 5 to 10 kilometers wide impacted in the South, the, the, the shallow sea that is currently the southern end of the Gulf of Mexico, the northern part of the Yucatan Peninsula. 
The crater is not really visible from the surface anymore. There's some stuff in surface topography if you look very closely, but it shows up very nicely if you look at the bedrock. So on the right there is a gravity anomaly map prepared by the United States Geological Survey, working with groups in Mexico. The current coastline sort of goes right through the middle of the crater, which is about 150 kilometers wide, and it's underneath 66 million years of lower density sediment piling on top of the bedrock. But if you go over with a gravity detector, you can pick up the depth to the bedrock and you see these circular rings. That is the impact crater. Louis and Walter Alvarez, who are working over at the University of California, Berkeley, in the 1980s, realized that everywhere they went in the world, and they looked at a bunch of old rocks, and there are 66 million year old rocks with dinosaur bones in them. Then there is a layer of rock, very narrow, that contains a big spike of, ir of iridium. And above that, there is rocks with no dinosaurs other than birds and a lot of other things missing. And that iridium spike indicates a large asteroid impact because on the Earth, like all terrestrial planets, almost all of the iridium melted into the metal part of the Earth, which is the core, thousands of kilometers below us and not accessible to the surface. So if you see an iridium spike everywhere in the world all of a sudden, that suggests something came in from outside and deposited bits all around the world. They associate this with the impact crater here in Chicxulub, and then people began to understand the asteroid impact hazard is a potentially serious problem. Initially the concern was big things like the dinosaur killing impact kilometers wide. The concern now is even also smaller objects down to the size of the Chelyabinsk impactor. But the goal becomes the same, discover as many near-Earth asteroids as possible, track their orbits, ideally discover everything down to the smallest size as possible, but the larger ones are easier to find than the smaller ones. The asteroid discovery surveys have been running for quite a long time now. The first near-Earth asteroid to be discovered, Eros, was discovered over 120 years ago now, but Photographic emulsion, large plates on the backs of telescopes, increased discovery rates quite a bit in the early part of the 20th century. And then in the 1990s, large format CCD cameras became available. Those of you who do astrophotography, remember CCDs are many, many times more sensitive than photographic film. So you can see fainter objects at the same size of a telescope. And you can also far more easily put things into the computer and try to fit the moving dots that you see and figure out which ones are on near Earth orbits. There are a large number of projects that do this. The most active ones right now are the Catalina Sky Survey at the observatories in the Catalina Mountains that are run by the University of Arizona. The Panstarch Project, which is run by the University of Hawaii on Maui. These are wide-angle sky surveys. They cover as much of the sky as possible. They go as deep as they can, and they coordinate with each other to avoid duplicating too much. And currently, things are being discovered at about 2,000 near-Earth asteroids per year. Upgrades are ongoing. That includes things like the Vera Rubin Observatory, currently being built in Chile, which will be a much larger telescope and will also cover much of the southern sky, which of course, cannot be seen from Hawaii or Arizona. And thus, a few asteroids do get missed because of that. There's also been efforts to do near-Earth asteroid discovery from space. Because a lot of these objects are on orbits that keep them on the sunward side of the Earth most of the time. And it's basically very hard to see from the ground. The WISE spacecraft, the Wide Field Infrared Space Explorer, was originally built as an astrophysics project. But Amy Mainzer, at the University of Arizona, previously at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, had been working for quite a long time, since before WISE launched, to use it to find near-Earth asteroids. WISE surveys continuously in a loop all around the sky at 90 degrees solar elongation. So it aims the solar panels at the sun, aims away from the Earth, 
the Earth out of the line of the telescope and just does a sweep all around the sky. And that finds a lot of asteroids and also gives us information on their sizes. Because if you do infrared with wise and optical, you can get some idea of the albedo and the size of the object. And given that sort of more than a factor of 10 range and how reflective these things are, if you want to know how big the asteroids you're finding are, things like WISE are pretty essential. NASA has now been working on a project called the Near Earth Asteroid Surveillance Mission, which is being led by Amy Mainzer and is designed to go to much closer to the sun than WISE did and cover much more of the sky. Again, the goal is to find near Earth asteroids that are on the sunward side. This is particularly relevant for things like the Chelyabinsk impactor, which were not able to be found by surveys that were active in 2013 because it came outwards from the sun, and thus near the sun on the sky when it impacted the Earth. There is a project now called Atlas, which is designed to find most things like the Chelyabinsk impactor before they impact. But it still has that gap near the sun, which is very hard to survey invisible light from the ground. So between this combination of Earth-based surveys and space-based surveys, quite a lot of asteroids are being discovered. All of these different surveys collaborating together to find near-Earth asteroids has been termed Space Guard. The term is from an old Arthur C. Clarke novel. I would prefer a better reference, but this is the one that got stuck. You can see here the discovery rate of near-Earth asteroids as a function of time. On the top is the total number of near-Earth asteroids being found each year. Color coding here is the different asteroid surveys. And then we have on the bottom large asteroids, estimated sizes bigger than one kilometer across. So you see discovery rates being relatively low in the mid-1990s. CCD cameras surveys came online, survey rates went up considerably. And then as new telescopes with larger aperture, larger field of view, better data processing come online, the discovery rates keep going up. But that's for, for all asteroids. You also see the discovery rate of large asteroids drops off pretty steeply. There was a project called Linear, started in the 1990s, which ran through until just a few years ago. It was designed to find, as efficiently as possible, objects a kilometer across on Earth-crossing orbits or larger. And it found a huge number of those. But there's only about a thousand of those objects, so after a while, you've surveyed all the orbits they can be on down to the brightness limit for a object one kilometer wide, and we found all of them. It's a little tricky because there's a couple one kilometer wide objects that are on orbital periods very similar to that of the Earth. So if they're on the far side of the sun, they stay there for a long time. And then they only now loop back around and we see them. But with that caveat, we can say that there will not be any impacts by objects one kilometer across or larger onto the Earth in the next few hundred years. There is one object, 1950 DA. It has a potential Earth impact in the year 2880. We cannot currently resolve the ambiguity if it will impact the Earth or not. Because, in large part, it's getting pushed around by radiation pressure. This is called the Yarkovsky effect. It's the first part of the Yorp effect that I mentioned earlier. And we don't know exactly which way it's going. It can be pushed forward along its orbit, it can push backwards along its orbit. It'll take a while to resolve this, probably. Although, there's a group at the University of Kent that's been working on that. And I've also worked on this some. But we have, fortunately, in this case, 760 years to rule that impact out. But that's the larger impactors. There remains the possibility of a smaller impactor, 100 meters across or so, perhaps 10% chance of that in the next few hundred years. And there remains the certainty that there will be other things like Chelyabinsk at some point or another mostly over ocean. The next most recent thing before Chelyabinsk was over the South Atlantic, South Indian Ocean, well south of Cape Town in 1963. But we'd like to know about anything like that's going to be over 
land anytime soon. So things like Atlas define things on short notice, things like all the other surveys here define the larger objects and rule out impacts as far into the future as possible remain important. My own work has focused mostly on characterizing near-Earth asteroids after they're already known. To refine our knowledge of their orbits, understand their shapes, spin state physical properties, which feed back into predicting the orbits because of the Yarkovsky effect. So to do this, I am part of a team that does radar observations of near-Earth asteroids. If you wish the radar team's websites, we have our web pages down on there on the bottom of this slide. We have high power radio transmitters mounted on large radio telescopes. You see here in the upper right the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, and then next to it the Goldstone Deep Space Network site in Southern California, which has a 70 meter antenna. It's used mostly for talking to spacecraft, but there's a transmitter on there. It can also be used to observe near Earth asteroids. We code the transmitted signal in time which lets us make sort of unusual images. So I have this radar signal going out from the object, from the Earth, it hits the object, it's reflected back towards the Earth. We time how long the signal takes to go out and come back, and we get a resolution and time delay of the radar signal. So effectively, we're doing lines across the object this way. That's one dimension of the images you're seeing on this picture. As the object spins, though, we have Doppler shift on the signal, because this part is moving towards us a little bit relative to the center, and this part is moving away. We thus get a second dimension of resolution, but these delayed Doppler images are not the normal pictures of the surface. So it could be kind of tricky to interpret what you're seeing. But we know how to do that after quite a lot of practice. And we see now the shapes and spin states and surfaces of several hundred objects. More so than we can visit a spacecraft. Or anyone can visit a spacecraft. The Different objects you here illustrate a few different types of things we see in the Earth population. We've got a lot of objects where we see visible boulders on the surface. In the upper left there is an object called 1982 UY4, which has a bunch of bright dots in the radar images. Those are boulders 10, 20 meters across, scattered across its surface. A student who worked with me, Nicholas Young, did some very interesting work trying to map out the boulders on the surface there. And as so far as we can tell, they are uniformly scattered across. But it's a little tricky because of the nature of the delayed Doppler images. I can't tell you if any individual boulder is in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. So the degree to which there's sorting going on on this object as compared to Itokawa, for example, is not clear. We also see a lot of contact binary objects. The radar images in the lower left here are an object called 2000 RS11. It is contact binary shape, but unlike Itokawa, it, ha it has a large flat piece and then a smaller piece that's more spheroidal that's sitting on the broad side of the thing. I don't quite know how you form that, because if you see most of the contact binaries, it would be over off to this side. This is shape modeling done by another student, Kaylee Brower, who's now at MIT. I still would like to figure, understand and figure out what's going on with this one. We keep seeing surprising new things like this. I would show you a 3D print of this one, because we can render it in the computer. If you go to the link there, you can get the 3D model files for a bunch of things. But most of my 3D prints are back at the office, which I can't get to right now. I apologize. On the lower right here, we see an object called 1994CC. The telephone numbers here are just designations that are assigned in order of discovery for the different asteroids. The first part is the year, the next part is the alphanumeric code assigned in sequence. With 2,000 asteroids per year, just the near-Earth objects alone, we have, as a community, given up assigning names to most of them. But you see in the middle there a roughly spherical object. Probably has a bit of equatorial bulge, although the evidence of that in this image is a little subtle. But it's roughly spheroidal. The important thing here is the bright dots up at the top of the image, so it's in front of it, closer to the Earth. And then down at the bottom, just behind the object. 
relative to the Earth. Those are two moons that are orbiting around the asteroid. They're very small. The main asteroid here is... I'm actually forgetting exactly how big it is, but roughly a kilometer. And the moons are only a couple of hundred meters. They're spinning very slowly as they orbit around the primary, which spins more quickly, so they are compressed left to right. They look a lot smaller that way direction than they actually are. But they are this whole small triple asteroid system, main asteroid and two moons spinning around it, all packed in with just a few kilometers of space. Double asteroids, the single satellites, triple asteroids like this one are very interesting because they give us information on the mass of the system. We apply Kepler's laws of the orbital period, given the separation between them, we get the mass. And that tells us things about density of the objects, which can inform things about internal structure. We know, for instance, that there are some binary asteroids that are significantly less dense than water, which, given that they are made of rocks, implies quite a lot of empty space inside the rubble pile. This matters for discussions of asteroid impact hazard, because if we have an asteroid that we find in the future that is going to impact the Earth, we first wish to know how big it is, we also wish to know how dense it is, because those two together determine the mass, and the mass and the velocity determine the impact energy, which is the relevant thing for the effects of an impact. If it's very porous, if it's more dense, these are also important things to consider when talking about asteroid deflection. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. First, I want to talk about other spacecraft, all the different spacecraft missions that have gone to near-Earth asteroids. So, as well as informing impact hazard predictions, general understanding of the near-Earth population, the shape models that we get from projects like this, so this is the asteroid called Betulia, it's shaped like this, it's roughly triangular, it's called, compared to a scone, people like food comparisons for some reason. Understanding that your asteroid is shaped like this, and it's spinning this way, and angled like this, so this side is in the sun when your spacecraft gets there. All this is very useful information if you are going out to an asteroid to have a, spa a spacecraft for whatever application. So, a lot of the spacecraft that have gone to near-Earth asteroids have gone to asteroids that have, have been observed with radar beforehand. There is one exception which is the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. But that's only one out of, actually, a fairly large number of spacecraft to near-Earth asteroids. So this chart keeps getting busier and busier because people keep planning and flying spacecraft to near-Earth asteroids. So far, these are all robotic. People have discussed human missions to near-Earth asteroids, but none have happened yet. If you are a space agency and you are in the business of sending spacecraft to different places, if you send a spacecraft to Earth orbit, you send spacecraft to the moon, where do you go next? Mars is quite popular, but it happens that a significant number of the near-Earth asteroids are easier to get to than Mars, in terms of the fuel required for a spacecraft. They're also easier to get back from. So while we are just now considering sample return missions from Mars, in terms of the Perseverance rover is designed to cache samples to be picked up by a spacecraft to be built later. There are three near-Earth asteroid missions that have already been launched, that have returned, have returned or will return samples to the Earth. And there have been a couple more near-Earth asteroid missions as well. So the first asteroid mission over on the upper left was the near Shoemaker spacecraft, which went to the asteroid Eros 20 years ago. It landed down the surface at the end of its mission. The Hayabusa spacecraft went to the asteroid Itokawa 15 years ago now. This is the other side from the image I showed you before. The landing site is just about the top middle in that fine grain dust. And then again, this briefly landed on the surface, came back up, came back to the Earth after some impressive engineering improvisation by the mission team, and return samples. In 2012, the Chang'e 2 spacecraft, which is part of the Chinese Space Agency's Lunar Exploration Program, 
had finished mapping the landing sites on the moon for the subsequent lunar landers and lunar rovers of the Jonga program. The mission team, led by the chief engineer, Hong Gang Chong, decided to do a, an unusual extended mission. They flew Chang'e 2 out to the Earth-Moon Lagrange point and did a halo orbit around the Lagrange point, which is a technique now being used for the relay satellite for the Chang'e 4 lunar lander on the lunar far side. Then they flew Chang'e 2 out of Earth orbit completely, and they arranged that it would be at the right spot, 7 million kilometers away from the Earth, when this asteroid in the lower right, sorry, lower left, Tutatis, came near the Earth. Tutatis' orbital period is not quite four years. So it comes near the Earth, just at one AU from the Sun, at four-year intervals for a couple of decades, and while well, the Earth is nearby, and then it's out of phase for quite a long time. So it was discovered actually back in the 1930s, and it got lost until 1988. Christian Polos, a French astronomer, discovered it, named it Tutatis after a character from Asterix Comics, and then came by in 92, 96, 2004, 08, 2012, 2016. Now it's out of sync again and will come back close to us for a while. But in 2012, the Tonga 2 team arranged to fly less than one kilometer away from Tutatis' surface. The Vader team, we had observed Tutatis beforehand. We had did a detailed shape model and understand it. it's pretty complicated rotation state. This was work originally done by one of my thesis advisors, Steve Ostro, and Scott Hudson, who's at Washington State University these days. The spin state of though keeps changing because it's spinning very slowly and keeps flying by the Earth, and gravitational tides spin it up and down in complicated ways. I had been studying that since 2008, Working with Yu Takahashi, who was then at the University of Colorado, was now at JPL, we made a detailed model of how Tutatis was spinning, predicted how it would be arranged in 2012. I'm really glad our model of what Tutatis was doing was right, because I did not expect Chaga 2 to be flown that close to the surface. But Tutatis was where we thought it was, and the spacecraft went very close without incident and got a impressive series of pictures. Now, the current near-Earth asteroid missions that are in space right now, and I'll talk a bit about those, are the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft, which is a JAXA project with some contributions from ESA, and the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which is a NASA project with contributions from the Canadian Space Agency. And these have gone to two different asteroids, Ryugu and Bennu. These both have this spit of spinning top shape. Maybe you compare it to a muffin or a cupcake with a lot of chocolate chips st stuck in it, or whatever analogy is appropriate to you. Abacus bead I have also seen. It results, we understand, from the Orp effect again. You have an asteroid that's roughly spheroidal. It's got a little irregularity. It spins up and up and up, and it bulges out around the middle to accommodate the extra angular momentum. If it did not have a rubble pile structure, if it was a pure fluid, it would become an ellipsoid. Like The Earth is roughly an ellipsoid. But here the friction inside the rubble pile matters significantly, and you actually end up getting this ridge with some irregularities depending upon which blocks are distributed where on the interior, and impact craters potentially messing things up. Both Hayabusa 2 and OSIRIS-REx are designed to land on the surface, pick up samples with different techniques, bring them back to the Earth. Hayabusa 2 did a lot of other things as well. It deployed a bunch of landers, hoppers, that spring-loaded thumpers that throw themselves up and land somewhere else and sample different parts of the surface that way. It carried a copper disc with an explosive charge behind it that was set off to slam the disc into the surface and make a crater so you could see impact cratering as it happens. And it also picked up samples. OSIRIS-REx is more focused on bringing back a larger mass of samples, and also upon getting extremely accurate, detailed information on Bennu's trajectory. Bennu has been observed with radar 
for many years now, before the spacecraft got there. Mike Nolan at the University of Arizona, previously at the Arecibo Observatory, produced a radar shape model which matches the size and shape of many you see there and also features one of the large blocks on its surface, the one in the lower right. And also very precisely measured Bennu's trajectory. It has a potential set of Earth impacts between 2175 and 2200. The measurements from the spacecraft, the laser ranging off of Bennu, and more detailed measurements of its shape and internal structure will hopefully help improve our forecasts and help rule out some of those possible impacts. There's a bunch of other near-Earth asteroid missions going forward. An EA Scout is a small NASA technology demonstration mission. There is the DART mission from, to the asteroid Didymos, which I'll talk about in a moment. And there is the Destiny Plus mission, which is going to asteroid 3200 Phaethon. Phaethon is an interesting case. It goes near the sun and gets heated up, and we understand thermal fracturing causes pieces of rock to get shot off into space. This produces the Gemini meteor shower, which has a stream of debris right along Phaethon's orbit. And then drifting around as radiation pressure pushes it, which is how it comes over to Earth. The Destiny Plus mission will fly past Phaethon. We've never gone to a source of an active meteor shower before. It's anybody's spacecraft. So it will be very interesting to see what Tomoko Are and company find with that project. Particularly since there's some inconsistencies between the dust coming off Phaethon right now and the magnitude of the Geminids. So exactly what's going on with dust coming out of asteroids is a more complicated question than might originally appear. There's a bunch of asteroid missions that have been proposed in various stages of development. The Hera mission, which is a follow-on to DART, which is led by ESA, is just recently been approved to go forward. Zhang He is a proposed asteroid sample return mission by the Chinese Space Agency. It would go to a small asteroid, Kamaolalewa, which is spinning very fast. So that implies a couple of things. One, it's very small, less than a couple hundred meters, spinning very quickly, implies that it's got a certain amount of tensile strength holding it together. And we see this for a lot of the old files, asteroids even. They're a little bit sticky, apparently. Van der Waals bonding, surface forces. But how do you land on something that's spinning that fast? That's an interesting control problem. I've heard some discussions of the Indian Space Usage Organization considering a asteroid mission. Nothing is currently going forward, I don't think. There is Yanis, which is a proposed mission to a couple of different binary near-Earth asteroids, which has gotten some development funding from NASA. So many different spacecraft going to many different asteroids. I'm going to touch briefly upon DART, Hayabusa 2, and Bennu, Osiris Rex 2 Bennu. The DART double asteroid redirection test mission is a proposal to demonstrate asteroid deflection. So there are several different ways we can talk about to move an asteroid that is on a trajectory to hit the Earth and move it slightly off to the side so that it doesn't hit the Earth. These generally work actually by slowing down or speeding up the asteroid very slightly. So its orbit is like this relative to the Earth's orbit. We want to slow it up, so slow, slow it down so that it arrives after the Earth passes through, or speed it up so that it goes through before the Earth does. Different ways to do this. People talk about something called the gravity tractor approach, where you build a large spacecraft as massive as possible, and you put it, park it next to the asteroid, and you hover probably some long-term solar electric propulsion system, and you angle your rocket exhaust so that it misses the asteroid. We don't think of pulling mountains towards us by standing next to them, but if you're in free fall already, it works very slowly. NASA proposed a project, the Asteroid Redirect Mission, to do this, but it works well only if your spacecraft is very massive, and it takes a long time to accumulate the offset in position from pulling on the asteroid. So the mission cost and timeline were 
not appealing to Con United States Congress selecting the project. The DART project uses a different technique, which is considerably faster, just less well controlled. This is kinetic impact or deflection. You literally hit the aster with a hammer, and you shove it out of the way. The hammer in this case is the entire DART spacecraft. So it roughly 600 kilograms, and it is to be launched just over a year from now, mid-2021. It will fly out to the asteroid Didymos, which is a binary asteroid. It's been observed with radar. We have a shape model. The spacecraft runs into the, not to, into the asteroid, not the main asteroid, but the satellite, Didymos Beta, which gets called Diddy Moon. It is to get a official name, which will be something different sometime soon. There will be a small CubeSat, which has been provided by the Italian Space Agency, riding along, but the main DART spacecraft gets destroyed on impact, rendered into teeny tiny pieces. The project is being led by Cheryl Reed at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. The modeling team over there informs me that the DART spacecraft will not be vaporized, but it will be turned into very, very small pieces. And it and a lot of the asteroid material will come back out as ejecta, and that ejecta will give additional momentum. Going this way, we get recoil pushing the asteroid that way. The CubeSat keeps on flying off to the side, it takes pictures as it goes, it keeps on going. To measure the momentum change that has been applied to the asteroid, you want to know the velocity change and the mass of the satellite. We can measure the velocity change from the ground. This will be done with a network of telescopes from Arecibo and Goldstone to optical telescopes to infrared microwave telescope potentially. It's been timed such that it will be visible and in the nighttime between for South America and North America. And over several days after the impact, it will all be studied in detail, which we can from the ground. The Hera spacecraft is to launch a few years later and go out to the asteroid, image the impact crater at very high resolution and get the mass of the satellite more precisely. And then we'll know exactly how much momentum got applied. And we'll have confidence between DART and Hera that we have at least one technique to deflect an asteroid if we have or have to do so for real. Point of interest, Didymos cannot hit the Earth on its current orbit. And the DART impact will push the entire system further away from the Earth, very slightly, as well as much more significantly moving around the satellite relative to the primary. So that is upcoming. The Two asteroid missions currently flying again are OSIRIS-REx and Hayabusa-2. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hayabusa-2, which has landed on Ryugu. This is a picture from a little over a year ago, showing the first landing site. It landed twice, once sampling the surface, touch and go. The Sample collection system is that long probe sticking out of the bottom of the spacecraft. And the schematic above, it touches down autonomous navigation, collects the sample by firing a pellet into the surface, which gets kicked up into the sample container, and then the spacecraft fires rockets and boosts itself back into a safe orbit. You see here the shadow of the spacecraft on the asteroid and the blast zone from where the rocket retro rockets fired to push it back up. They then landed a second time into the excavated material from the impactor experiment. So that copper slug that I mentioned earlier impacted the surface throughout a crater a couple meters deep. Then you sample material that was below the surface. And then you can get a sense of how material reacts to being exposed to space for different amounts of time. That different amounts of solar wind, different amounts of radiation, so on. These samples are now on their way back to the Earth. And good luck to the Hayabusa 2 team with landing that stuff in Australia and analyzing everything that gets back. 
The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is currently doing a series of low-altitude flybys over its landing site, which is a patch of relatively fine grain material on the surface of Bennu. This has been complicated by something unexpected. Bennu is kicking up dust all by itself. I mentioned how 3200 faith on the source of the Gemini meteor shower. There is no meteor shower associated with Bennu, but it's putting out small clumps of material a centimeter or so across out into space in these erratic dust excavation events. I'm not entirely sure what's causing that. People argue thermal fracturing, expansion, contraction. It seems to happen a bit right on the Terminator. Sunlight cutting off. Things contract, stress builds up, things release. I've been thinking about electrostatic charge there as well, still unclear. But the mission team had to carefully consider and plan out their trajectory and landing to avoid the spots where this has been happening, because you don't want your spacecraft to get hit by a dust clump unexpectedly. At the same time, landing on the surface and collecting sample, in the case of Bennu, they use a nitrogen gas jet to do that. Also kicks up a bunch of dust and debris. There's some very dramatic pictures from Hayabusa 2 for that. So spacecraft is designed to handle a certain amount of dust and they plan to navigate through it. So good luck to Daniel Loretta and company with the landing on Bennu, which again is all being programmed remotely into OSIRIS-REx and it has to do that all by itself because there's no human in the loop that far away. And then, ideally, soon after collecting the samples, Cyrus Rex will finish its observations on Bennu and bring those samples back to the Earth. I've talked about quite a lot of stuff, many different spacecraft missions, the asteroid impact hazard, general asteroid science. If I was giving this talk in person, I would now stop and ask to take any questions you may have. Since we're not Unable to do this live, I will keep looking at the chat window for this throughout the last few minutes, and this is happening in real time, and if people are watching this several months after the fact, I apologize that I cannot answer any questions you might have right now. I hope you enjoyed watching Near Earth Asteroids impact hazards, and space missions with Dr. Michael Bush of the SETI Institute. These programs are produced by Mount Tam Astronomy in collaboration with the Friends of Mount Tam, with the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers, and with Wonderfest, the Bay Area beacon of science. The programs are free and open to all. Mount Tam Astronomy is organized by Tinka Ross, and this video was produced by John Navas. To attend a live program, followed by live telescope viewing of the night sky, or for a list of upcoming Astronomy Nights programs, visit our website at friendsofmounttam.org. For Mount Tam Astronomy, I'm Tucker Hyatt.